Good day everyone, this is Dr. Soper here, and today I'll be discussing convolutional neural networks and deep convolutional cue learning. If you're unfamiliar with artificial neural networks or cue learning, then I would recommend that you watch the earlier video in this series entitled Foundations of Artificial Neural Networks and Deep Cue Learning before watching this video. Before we begin discussing convolutional neural networks and deep convolutional cue learning, let's briefly review what you'll learn in this lesson. By the time you have finished this video, you will know what convolutional neural networks are, how convolutional neural networks work, including a discussion of feature maps and convolution, max pooling, flattening, and connecting to fully connected layers to generate predictions. Finally, we'll discuss how deep convolutional cue learning works. Once we understand all of these concepts, we'll be able to build convolutional neural networks that can perform some amazing tasks, such as identifying objects and images in video, or playing video games at a level that exceeds human capabilities. So let's get started. To begin, let's see if we can develop an intuitive understanding of what convolutional neural networks are and why they are useful. Put simply, a convolutional neural network, or CNN, is a type of artificial neural network that is designed for use with data that have a spatial structure. Examples of data that have spatial structures include images, videos, and text. Although convolutional neural networks can be used with text, they are primarily used for computer vision related tasks, so we'll focus primarily on image-based input in this video. So what do we mean by data that have a spatial structure? Let's answer this question by considering this photo of my cat, Lyra. Although we don't ordinarily notice it, digital images such as this are composed of small squares called pixels. If we zoom in on Lyra's eye, for example, we can see that it is composed of dozens of pixels. Now what's important to understand here is that the location of each pixel has meaning. Put differently, it is only because the pixels are arranged in this particular way that we are able to identify that this is an image of a cat. If we were to randomly reorder all of the pixels in this image, then it would become an image of random noise rather than an image of a cat, even though the randomly reordered image would contain all of the same pixels as the original image. So this is what is meant by data that have a spatial structure. It is not just the data values themselves that are important, but also the spatial location of each data value with respect to the other data values. The same concept, of course, applies to text. Consider this quote from Hamlet. Thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. Here, Marcellus is addressing Horatio, and is suggesting that since Horatio is a scholar, he should be the one to speak to the ghost of Hamlet's father. Again, the order or location of each word in the sentence has value. If we were to randomly reorder all of the words in the sentence, then we would find that we can no longer understand the meaning that Shakespeare was attempting to convey. Speak scholar avow it to Horatio art. Unlike traditional artificial neural networks then, convolutional neural networks are intentionally designed to capture the spatial relationships among all of the individual input values, such as the location of a pixel within an image or the location of a word within a sentence. Next, let's briefly consider a high-level overview of how convolutional neural networks work. Broadly then, a convolutional neural network works by first generating a set of feature maps for each input case. Put another way, in this first step, we are creating the data for the convolutional layer. Next, we use a technique called pooling to simplify each feature map. Third, we flatten the pooled feature maps and finally, we connect the flattened pooled feature maps to traditional fully connected layers, thus allowing information to forward propagate through the rest of the network, ultimately yielding our predictions. With this broad overview in mind, let's consider how each of these steps works in detail. When an item such as an image is input into a convolutional neural network, the first step in processing the image is to apply one or more filters, which are also known as feature detectors or kernels, to the image. These filters can be designed manually or can be generated automatically, for example, by using a different neural network that is designed to generate filters. The purpose of a filter is to determine whether a particular part of an image contains a specific feature. Features can be things such as lines, curves, shapes, etc. After applying a filter to an input image, 
The result is what is known as a feature map, and it is the collection of feature maps for a convolutional neural network that constitutes what is known as the convolution layer. Let's see some examples of all of these concepts in action. Here we see the pixels of a simple black and white image. For purposes of this demonstration, this image can be represented as a matrix, where a value of 1 indicates a black pixel and a value of 0 indicates a white pixel. Next, we see a sample of a 3x3 filter. This filter has 1s toward the upper left corner, indicating that it is designed to detect short vertical lines. Finally, we see an empty matrix. As we apply the filter to different parts of the image, we will be able to fill in values in this matrix. This is the process of creating a feature map. Let's see how this process of constructing a feature map actually works. The general idea is that we're going to apply our 3x3 filter to every possible 3x3 section of the image, beginning in the upper left and working our way to the lower right. To apply the filter, we take the product of the filter and the current 3x3 section of the image. This simply means that we multiply each element in the filter by its corresponding element in the 3x3 section of the image. In this particular example, we're applying the filter to the upper leftmost section of the image. There are no overlapping ones between the filter and this section of the image, so the result of applying the filter to this section of the image is the number 0, which becomes the first entry in the feature map. We would next slide the filter one pixel to the right, and then find the product of the filter with the next 3x3 three three section of the image. This process repeats until we reach the end of the row, at which time we move one pixel down and again begin applying the filter from left to right. In this next example, we're steadily making progress applying our filter to the image. In this case, there is direct overlap between the two ones in the filter and the 3x3 three three section of the image. We thus record a value of 2 in the feature map for this step. After applying the filter to all 3x3 three three sections of the image, we're able to successfully fill in all of the values on the feature map. This feature map thus indicates the degree of overlap between the filter and all of the sections of the image. Finally, we can apply many different filters to the same input image. In this way, we can detect a variety of different lines, curves, shapes, etc. in the image. The resulting collection of feature maps comprises what is known as the convolution layer. Congratulations! You now understand how convolution works in convolutional neural networks. Next, let's talk about max pooling. In convolutional neural networks, the purpose of max pooling is to reduce the size of each feature map. Reducing the size of the feature maps is important because it simultaneously reduces the complexity of the model. This means that we'll have fewer parameters to estimate, which will yield faster, more efficient learning. Max pooling is implemented in much the same way as applying filters to the input image. So if you understood how filters are applied, then understanding max pooling will be quite straightforward. The only conceptual difference is that in max pooling, the window jumps by its complete size rather than sliding one pixel at a time. Let's see some examples to clarify these concepts. Remember, the purpose of max pooling is to reduce the size of the feature map. In this example, we'll reduce a feature map that contains 25 elements to a pooled feature map that contains just 9 elements. As with applying filters, we process the input feature map one section at a time. Here, for example, we're processing the input feature map in 2x2 two two sections. As you can see, in max pooling, we simply take the maximum value from the section that we're currently examining and then insert that value into the pooled feature map. Rather than sliding the window one pixel at a time, however, in max pooling the window jumps by its complete size. Since in this example our window is a 2x2 two two section, we jump two columns to the right and then perform the next max pooling operation. In this case, the maximum value in the next section is 2, so we enter that value into the pooled feature map. If the window does not overlap perfectly with the size of the feature map, we simply let it overhang the edge and take the maximum available value for the pooled feature map as shown here. After completing this process, our 25-element input feature map has been reduced to a 9-element pooled feature map. Next, let's talk about flattening. 
Flattening is a very straightforward and simple process whose goal is to reduce a two-dimensional pooled feature map to a one-dimensional vector. As shown here, this is accomplished simply by taking each row in the pooled feature map and using it to construct our vector, one row at a time. Remember that we will typically have multiple pooled feature maps. Each pooled feature map is added to our vector, one feature map at a time. The final result then is a single vector that contains all of the values from all of the pooled feature maps. Finally, we simply need to connect our vector to the other dense, fully connected layers that comprise the rest of our deep neural network. This is very easy. Our vector of values representing the input image simply becomes the input into the deep neural network. As shown here, the feature vector simply serves as the input layer for the deep neural network. In this way, all of the information about the image, which is stored in a compressed form in the feature vector, can be used by the downstream layers in the neural network. Finally, we just need to connect all of these ideas to deep Q learning. To create a deep convolutional Q learning network, we simply need to use what we've learned about convolutional neural networks as a front end to feed information into a deep Q learning network. This allows deep Q learning networks to use visual information, such as images or video frames, as input and opens the door to training artificial neural networks to perform tasks such as controlling a self-driving car by using cameras, playing video games, analyzing movies or TV shows for inappropriate content, or any other task that relies on visual input. This is very cool stuff. Now that we have a good understanding of how convolutional neural networks work and how they can be used in conjunction with deep Q learning, we're ready to begin building some AI agents that rely on these technologies. In the next video in this series, we'll implement an AI agent that uses a convolutional network and deep Q learning to learn to play a classic video game. We will definitely be getting a lot of practical hands-on experience in creating a sophisticated AI agent in Python in the next video, so I hope you'll join me as we continue our adventures in cognitive computing and artificial intelligence. Well my friends, thus ends our lesson on convolutional neural networks and deep convolutional Q learning. I hope that you learned something interesting in this lesson, and until next time, have a great day.